Hi. In this video, I want to answer a couple of questions related to clusters. And remember that this is a generic topic throughout the course. So basically, first I introduce some algorithms and then we have starting some doubts about which algorithm is better. So the questions that I want to answer in this video are these two. The first one is which method is better or which method should I use? And the second question is, does my cluster make any sense? So I'll try to answer those questions, introducing some metrics and also some methodology. So the first idea, as usual, is trust your eyes. So before clustering, visualizing is a good idea. So you can download this code and, and ggplot that. So by simple inspection, we see that clearly we have one cluster there and probably two clusters there. But I have some doubts. Maybe this is one cluster and this is another big cluster. Okay. So this is a very good idea to start like that. The second thing that we can do is try to plot the distance between different points. So we are going to compute a matrix in which every line in the matrix is the distance between every point to any other point. And take a look at that. Okay. If you look at the scale, you see that dark red means that you have points which are closer together and dark blue means that you have points that are far apart together. In this example, you have, I would say, one fourth of the data which is close together and the other part which is also close together and is far away from the other points. So probably this block corresponds to this group of points there and this larger block to this group of points there. But also if you take a look at this larger part, which corresponds to this, to this part, you can also try to see somehow you have two blocks. So that makes sense again, taking a look at this. So maybe we have still two clusters. So maybe, I'm not sure at this point, but, but we have learned a lot just by inspecting this diagram and also the data itself. Okay, this is hard to read, but you, you can do some control. So if instead of plotting data, you plot some random numbers, and here you can see that the x coordinate is a randomly distributed number and also the vertical one, you see that you'll lose that pattern. So you still see some blocks there because this is ordered by distance, but you can see that these are very, very light, so very bright. So you don't see any clear pattern there. Instead, if you compare with a clearer situation, in this case, you have 50% of the data far away from all the 50%, then this sort of diagram is going to be clear. But well, for a couple of plots, it's not that bad. What if we cannot plot the data because it's not two dimensional? What if we have highly dimensional data? In that case, we can use principal component analysis in order to plot that. So let's use this function fvis PCA from the Facto Extract Library. And then this is the projection of the, uh, on the first two principal components. Here is not that clear, but I would say that you have clustered information there. So you see a lot of points which, whose distance is not that large. Maybe another cluster there that could be extended to this part. And I don't know, maybe a couple of clusters which are, I don't know, formed with less number of observations, but this could be outliers. If we take a look at the distance diagram, you see that you have a block structure there, but here is not that clear. So it's not so different from the random distribution, but this is life. Okay, so this, prob this problem is going to be hard, probably, but at least we have an idea that we, we shouldn't be trusting so much different observations coming from different methods. So trust your eyes because methods are blind and sometimes you have a fancy cross-validation method and, and you get to the answer that you, the best choice is having k equals 4, but sometimes you cannot believe that. Okay, let's go back to our first question and remember that video in which we discussed a couple of hierarchical methods. One was called aggre aggregation methods and this is called Agnes in general. But we could also have divisive methods, we call Diana, in which we start with all the points clustered together and we were pruning this tree in order to have a good representation of the data. And let me tell you this, there is no one better model. It depends strongly on the data. Okay, so let's trust your eyes again, but now comparing a couple of models. So let's take this data set and then we're going to do some R computations. We're going to use the library cluster and we have a couple of methods there. One method is aggregative or aggregation cl hierarchical clustering, Agnes, and the AG comes from aggregation, so it's easy to, to remember. So we, using the methods that we covered in another video, you can decide that K equals two is the best representation. So you have this dendrogram, and this goes to this idea that we have a big cluster there corresponding to the red lines, and a small cluster there corresponding to the blue ones. Let's try now div divisive. Did remember that Diana starts with divisive. And again, if you take a look at a simple dendrogram, then you see that K could be two or maybe three. Why is that? Because the largest distance is the largest jump is this one. So if you cut here, you have two clusters, but followed by this jump here. So if you cut there, you have three clusters. Actually, this jump there from this point to this height from to this height is also large. 
So k equals 4 could be a, a reasonable choice according to this diagram. But anyway, so now what we're going to do is compare the predictions of both clusters, um, clustering methods. If you cut the tree at that level and then you create a table with the predictions of both clusters, you see that in both cases you're calling the same cluster with the same name. Or better say, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the names, so because we could, al we could also have 0, 170, 50, 0, that would be perfect matching. So in this case, agreement is 100% accurate. Okay, let's do another comparison, in this case visually again. And we're going to use this, this library, then the extend. We have this function on tanglegram, and we have to transform the output of these two functions into a dendrogram form. So if you call this function simply calling the, the two dendrograms, you have a nice plot, but if you tweak a little bit these parameters, like using this, these functions there, you have something like this, which is a fancy representation of how to compare both. So here you have the first dendrogram according to aggregative hierarchical clustering and this is divisive clustering and you can see that you have perfect matching in the sense that both clusters are e equally likely but also if you descend to lowest parts of the tree if you go to the leaves you see that there is a lot of coincidence there so whenever you have color lines instead of gray lines that means that the, the lower parts of the diagram are clustered together meaning that both representations are going to be almost identical Again, this is only visual, but I think sometimes we can see a lot of patterns taking a look at these diagrams. Of course, this is going to be useful just for small data sets, because otherwise this is going to be kind of messy. So here you have another example. Here I'm using the data set of the US arrest that I've covered in another video. And here the description is pretty nice, so you can see that you have only 50 observations. And then you can see how, in, in, except in a few cases in the co corresponding to the gray lines, Clustering is going to be identical almost at the, at the leaf level. And we have a couple of ways to compare. So I'm going to introduce now some measures of comparison between clusters that are also going to provide some, some way to compare methods. So the first type of metrics is, are, are called internal measures and it, typically we are going to cover three of them. Connectivity, silhouette, coefficient and done index. And the second type of methods are called stability measures, also called external measures. And basically they are trying to find consistency, which is a kind of cross-validation, and I'll talk about that later. The first idea is pretty intuitive, it's called connectivity, and tries to measure to what extent items are placed in the same cluster as their nearest neighbors. So you imagine a situation like this, and for some reason you have these points in the purple and in the blue cluster, but this kind of problems can be problematic, because the, the nearest neighbor of this point is going to be this one, and the nearest neighbor of this point could be that one. So of course this is a a problem because that means that we have a fuzzy region in which you are not sure in which cluster we should compare. So connectivity is a quantitative measure of that metric. The other index is called the Dan index and it's similar to the, to the silhouette width that we have covered in another video. The idea is that we are going to compare the distances of each cluster to any other point of the cluster. We are going to define the minimum of this pairwise comparison and this is going to be the same as in the case of the silhouette method. So basically the green part of the equation is going to be the minimum value from each point of one cluster to any other point on another cluster. And now we're going to do another metric. Instead of taking the average as we did in the case of the silhouette, we're going to take the maximum distance, so the diameter of each cluster. Okay, but, but uh, besides that, it's going to be almost the same as the silhouette computation. And now the Dan index is the ratio between the minimum intercluster separation, so the most conservative estimation of the distance there, to the least conservative one, which is the maximum intercluster diameter. Okay, let's play with R, let's take a look at this data set again. And we have this library, which is called CLValid, from clustering validation, something like that. And then we're going to use three methods, hierarchical, k-means, and let's say PAM. Hierarchical means, in general, aggreg aggregative hierarchical clustering. We're going to call that function, CL valid. I'm going to try it from, t to, to, from two to six clusters, and then I'm going to use internal validation. And automatically, this is magic. We have information about all the situations from two to six, and we have different values for different computations. And this is the nice part of the algorithm. For each of these clusters, we have these numbers, and then we take the better of all those experiments. And here you can see that according to the three metrics, the number of clusters equals two is the winner. And also we have for free method selection. So according to this internal consistency methods, hierarchical clustering is the better. The other group of measures are called external met metrics or stability measures. And there are different types, but the idea is the following. So imagine that you have a data set and you have more than two variables. You have 
uh, at least three variables. And then you're going to do a kind of cross validation. So we're going to remove one of the columns randomly or try with all the, with iterating throughout all the columns. And we're going to compute the dendrogram. And then we are going to estimate which is the better choice there. In this case, the highest jump is in th at this point. So probably cutting at two is the best one. Now we incorporate that column again and we remove another column. And you can do that for all the variables or for a randomly selected number of them. So you have a family of, of dendrograms that you can compare. And now we are going to use the following metrics. So we are going to define average proportion of non-overlap, which is the average proportion of observations not placed in the same cluster with the full data and with data from a single column remove. So here basically we're trying to see if removing one variable, how our cluster is affected at the observation level. And the other metric would be average distance. And in this case, we are not looking at individual observations, but we are taking a look at the mean distance between elements in the same cluster. The third metric is going to be the average distance between means, meaning the distance between centers of different clusters. The last one is a little bit more abstract, but the idea is that you can remove one of the columns and then you measure the variance of introducing that or removing that. Okay, let's do that in R. We're going to use again the, the, the function CL valid. And here we're going to use a different data set instead of the one in two dimensions, we're going to use the USRS data set. And the reason is that we have to remove columns iteratively, so we cannot apply this method for two dimensional data sets. Okay, so here is the outcome of this function. Now the method that we are using is the stability, meaning that we are using external validation. And again, we are trying different clusters from two to six, and you see a couple of things there. So different methods provide different observations. In this case, different number of clusters as the winning ones. We also have method, method selection for free. And in this case, I would say that hierarchical is the winner. Why is that? All of these methods are good uh, because the, the algorithm is telling us that there is strong consistency in, in this approach. But remember that we only have 50 observations in this data set, 50 states of the U United States. And having six clusters doesn't make much sense to me because that means that overall we have only eight observations per cluster. So again, using statistics, but also using common sense, I would say that two clusters are good enough for this problem.